Every once in a while, I play a game for the first time that sweeps me away in its gameplay to such an extent that I accidentally end up spending entire days and even nights playing it. As I was playing the final chapters of Fire Emblem back around the start of 2023, that's exactly what happened to me once again. And that alone makes this an exceptional game to me. Now, back when this game was first released, I was young, and I was completely obsessed with Golden Sun, and had really no ability to pay attention to any other Game Boy Advance games. But after all these years, I've decided I'm interested in exploring the Fire Emblem franchise, and I wanted to start with the game that would have been available to me had I had the attention span and time to, uh, you know, pick it up at the time it was current. So here is my review of 2003's Fire Emblem for Game Boy Advance, the seventh title in the Fire Emblem franchise, and the first one that was released in North America. Also, the first Fire Emblem I have ever played. Fire Emblem's backstory is beautifully illustrated in a text-narrated prologue that plays from the start screen. The setting is the fantastical continent of Elibi, Elibe, Elibe, Elibi, Elibe, Elibe, where mankind used to live together peacefully with dragons a millennium before the time period the game takes place in. For reasons unclear, the peace ended when mankind suddenly waged a war called the Scouring against the dragons, nearly wiping them out and allowing for mankind to spread across the land and divide it into kingdoms that remain in the time the player experiences. Fire Emblem uniquely immerses the player into the action of the story as an apprentice tactician taking part in an adventure on Yulibi a millennium after the scouring. You even provide your character a unique name which is referred to when you are directly addressed by characters in story cutscenes. Your story begins when you are found unconscious on the plains of Sakai by a young woman named Lin, who initially seems to be no more than a simple sword fighter. The two join forces and together begin a journey led by chance and fate that organically introduces additional characters in conflict as the story unfolds. Simple beginnings lead to an epic end, and the story is ultimately a compelling one of relatable characters defending the people and places they care about, with a medieval fantasy backdrop that is enchanting yet grounded. The story involves politics between kingdoms and war, but there are magical and mysterious forces at work in this world as well. This duality is even paralleled by the combat of the game, which includes both brutal physical weapons and enigmatic magical spells. There are many characters, both benevolent and villainous, to encounter, and even some enemies who can be brought over to your side. The huge size of the cast precludes deep character development for most characters, but there is ample character growth and personality given to the few main characters who are central to the story. The supporting cast are still a diverse and fascinating group to learn about, even if only superficially, as the story progresses. Even obscure characters are given at least one or two scenes in the spotlight throughout the lengthy story sections that are sandwiched between the battles of the game's chapters. It's Radical Wrath! A lot of this content is optional to experience, and must be discovered by the player through correct on-field exploration and character usage choices, which makes for more engaging storytelling. An occasional story or dialogue dump can be a little long, but I mostly felt like the story was given attention and time proportionate and complementary to the gameplay, which is quite substantial in its own right. The story is above average, and... I'm even happier to say that Fire Emblem distinguishes itself most it's totally with the true. most important part Fire of any video game, gameplay. It's the coolest. Fire Emblem's gameplay is rich with depth, but the game eases one into this depth beautifully. As one begins playing, lightly narrated explanations guide the player through battle in a hands-on approach that is integrated into the game's story. 
The very first battle in the game is not difficult, but it does advance the story. It isn't some isolated training exercise that doesn't matter. For the first few chapters of the game, the late guidance will re-emerge when you encounter a new mechanic or a new type of unit for the first time. The tutorials are concise, non-intrusive, and efficiently taught me how the game works at a good pace that wasn't overwhelming. The complexity of the combat was spoon-fed to me in a painless fashion without ever needing to reference any manual or guide. I couldn't even tell when the tutorial formally ended as it was seamlessly woven into the gameplay experience and faded away by the time I reached the last third of the game or so. The tutorial content may be a bit basic for tactical JRPG veterans, but it can be turned off if so. However, for any gamers new to tactical JRPGs, I feel this game does a wonderful job acclimating them to this kind of gameplay just with in-game guidance. The instruction manual does offer all the same information and a little extra beyond that, though. Look up a PDF scan of it if you don't have one physically and want to check it out. Some fantastic artwork in there. The gameplay experience of Fire Emblem is essentially a long sequence of overhead tactical JRPG battles with only some menu-based inventory and character management in between each one. Despite this simple formula, I found this game to be one of the most immersive and addicting that I've ever played in any genre. Because he's radical rare! And it's because intelligent systems do an incredible job of using this simple framework to simulate the grinding campaign of a group of mercenaries in a tumultuous fantasy world plagued by political instability. The game is bursting with its RPG customization options. Like a real tactician for a military, I had to consider all sorts of logistics and options for approaching each of the game's battles. What do we know about the enemy units? What is the battlefield's terrain? Are there mountains that can give wyvern riders and pegasus knights cover? Are there locked away treasures I could use the help of a thief to plunder? You can only take a handful of your units, usually around 10, with you into each chapter's battle, and I had reason to bring a slightly different set of units into each single battle due to their diverse strengths and weaknesses. Beyond that, I also had reason to outfit those units in unique ways for each battle. Perhaps I should discuss the abilities and traits of individual units before I get too far ahead of myself. Let me provide an idea of how the battle flow works in Fire Emblem. In battle, you take turns moving all of your units and then watching all opposing units move against them in response. Each individual character can typically move once per turn, either only to cover distance on the map or to engage an enemy unit in battle. When any unit attacks another, a larger detailed sprite for each character will take a position on each side of the screen and carry out their attacks into a clash of stunningly awesome attack animations. These exchanges can be as short as one blow, but trading multiple counterattacks is also possible at times. Physical attack effectiveness is influenced by the weapon triangle. Swords beat axes, axes beat spears, and spears beat swords. There are a few weapons that break these rules, but the weapon triangle is largely upheld and it makes a huge impact in combat. There's also a parallel trinity of magic in the game, and that governs the combat of magic-wielding character classes. Anima beats light magic, light magic beats dark magic, but not in coolness, and dark magic beats anima. And if you're wondering, anima is just what this game calls spells based on fire, thunder, wind, or rain. There's no armor to worry about equipping units with in this game, instead equipment management is largely just limited to weapons. All units in Fire Emblem possess some inherent class that dictates which weapons they're able to use and what their stat strengths are. On top of this, each character has a specific level of proficiency with a given weapon or magic type, and that can be advanced simply by using that weapon type more. Six weapon levels provide a lot of room for characters to improve it using a specific weapon, particularly for characters who are capable of using multiple kinds of weapons. Most basic classes possess the ability to be promoted to more advanced classes, and those promotions just about always come with the ability to use an entirely new weapon or form of magic in addition to the character's original one. Radical Wrath deserves a promotion.
how much more radical you just became. That's incredible. It's beyond awesome to witness all the combinations and skill sets that become possible as more units reach these promotions. From warriors who wield axes and bows, to druids who wield both dark magic and healing staffs. It causes the versatility and options at the player's disposal for meeting the game's challenges to explode later in the game. Promotion isn't so easy that it can be abused, however. To promote any character, they must reach at least level 10, and a specific and somewhat rare item must be used to promote them. These promotion items are sometimes gifts, but some of them can also be found by exploring the maps and talking to people in houses or villages. And uh, to draw a comparison to a more mainstream JRPG, I would say class promotion in this game is a bit like using a water stone to evolve your polywhirl into a polywrath in Pokemon. I would say that Fire Emblem for GBA has the most immersive game world of any tactical RPG I've played. This is in large part because the maps of this game are so self-contained. They aren't just the maps your units move and battle on before they're magically and instantly transported to the safety of some disembodied sanctuary of repose. No, no. These are the maps where your units socialize, rest, talk to villagers, and even visit vendors to go shopping in between fighting enemies. You may not do all these things on every map, but the point is that all the necessities of a game like this are self-contained on the maps and the continuity between all the activities one may engage in this fantasy war epic is preserved. Optional support conversations can occur between specific units if they stop next to one another in specific chapters. Trees can be chopped down to make bridges across rivers, cracked walls broken to breach castles, and character promotion can be done in the middle of a chapter's battle in epic fashion. Dynamically changing weather can affect various units by different degrees. This is just a prime example of doing more with less in a video game. Combining simple parts intelligently such that they create a whole greater than their parts. The result is a highly interactive gameplay, rich with depth that takes place almost exclusively on simple overhead grid maps. Masterful. One integral ingredient of Fire Emblem's potently immersive gameplay recipe is permanent death. I love this game for permanently killing my characters. Why? Because it establishes stakes. At all times in Fire Emblem, I had something to lose. I had units to protect. I had motivation to play well and direct my units skillfully to keep them alive. And the consequences I faced should I let them perish in battle, or that I, the player, would have a harder time in future battles if I allowed my army to be decimated before they reached the harder battles awaiting in later chapters. This constant pressure made each turn of battle exciting, and I was taken by surprise on more than one occasion by deaths resulting from my unknowing negligence as an inexperienced tactician. I lost a total of 13 units in my journey with this game. Though seven of those were right at the end, and at that point I may have suspended my immersion and carelessly threw a few units at the last boss just to crank out the win. It was quite a difficult game, all said and done, and though the difficulty didn't really start increasing until the last half of the game, uh, the difficulty is there, you just have to get to it. Bear in mind that I didn't suffer a single death until that last half. Early on it was quite easy. In addition to the losses my army endured, I did get multiple game overs, which results if you let one to three specific important characters die. If you get a game over, you just have to try the chapter again from the start. I did deliberately start over a few times when I lost a powerful character early in easily preventable circumstances of any chapter, but when a death happened near the end of an hours long chapter I had put a lot of effort into, I was more inclined to just live with it in those cases. The importance and forced use and protection of the main characters may be the closest thing to an annoyance I had while playing. They are the only units you're forced to keep alive, but it generally wasn't too big a deal. Offsetting the permanent deaths I suffered were the many characters I continued to find to expand my ranks as I progressed through later chapters. 
Some of these units were quite powerful, and I never really felt under threat of running out of units to use in battle. Deciding which units I wanted to use and favor uh, and give valuable experience to, that was the larger concern. I spent a lot of time weighing such choices because I enjoyed taking my time as I poured over all the options in this game. I accumulated about 60 hours on my save file by the time I beat it, and I probably could have beaten it in about half that time. You could probably beat it in half that time if you were in a rush. But I hate to rush, unless I'm playing a game like F-Zero. I'll make some brief comments on the visuals and the audio of Fire Emblem. Visually, the game puts a lot more effort into its sprites and battle animations than its environment, and this focus feels pretty fitting and appropriate considering the focus of the gameplay on battle. I do think the bird's eye view of the simple 2D landscapes and structures is charming in its own way, but the animations of the battle units clearly steal the show in Fire Emblem. These animations are extensive and a delight to watch. Any given character class has a unique attack animation for each weapon they're capable of wielding, and on top of that, an extra critical hit attack animation for each one of those. There isn't just one cool animation to see here. From spinning lances to fireworks of sorcery, there's a lot of eye candy to make battles fun to watch, even over hours of gameplay in some chapters. I did enjoy the raindrops or snowflakes which fell during weather changes in some chapters as well. The sound effects of battle are as satisfying as the battle animations. There are some great impactful physical weapon sounds with a lot of punch and spell sound effects that sound like they could be made by an 80s synthesizer. Very cool stuff. I'd call the music of Fire Emblem above average, though not on the tier of something like a Castlevania soundtrack. I can at least say I never got tired of hearing the music which played during each chapter, though some chapters took me many hours to complete, as I've mentioned. My favorite track is by far the main theme which plays on starting the game up. It's an inspiring, rousing composition that does a great job of giving any young and naive would-be tactician the confidence to go off to war and lead an army of equally naive soldiers to their deaths in tragic circumstances resulting from a combination of inexperience and the sheer cruelty of fate. Great title theme. Uh, incredibly memorable and catchy. Fire Emblem is a special masterpiece. It's one of those JRPGs that delivers nearly unlimited customization and personalization options, and the path each individual takes to the end of this game is going to be different due to the endless permutations of combinations of character choices, equipment options, battle strategies, and permanent deaths one may experience in the campaign. It parallels Pokemon games in that regard, though I would argue that Fire Emblem's nuance and immersion are rivaled by few other games. The potential number of strategies unlocked by being able to maneuver many characters on a large map is staggering. Fire Emblem tames and contains the madness and complexity of this strategic framework. This game is perfectly crafted to appeal to any JRPG fan, whether inexperienced or veteran. This game has the non-intrusive, off-switchable tutorials to cater to any skill level, and it gets difficult enough by its end to engage those who love to be challenged as well. This is one of the best games ever made, and certainly the best strategy RPG I've played thus far in my life. For anyone who knows that they enjoy this genre of game, I would call this one essential. <laughs> 